Hi guys, welcome to the inaugural edition of Nicola Lurs Chess with International Master Elizabeth Pechts. Welcome Hello. Elizabeth. Thank you. Hello everybody. Uh, so, as as you guys know, we this this is a this is going to be a European EU friendly stream. It's gonna, this is a, it's permanent time. It's going to be every Wednesday at seven a.m. New York time, which is one p.m. East uh, one p.m. Central European time. So I'm very much looking forward to to this inaugural stream and to future sessions with Elizabeth, Miss Messi. Right. <laughs> well, but sometimes I can be quite serious too when it comes to teaching. So yes. All so right. Nicola, for today I prepared a mix of different things just to see um, where are your stronger parts and where are your weaker parts. And based on the way you are solving these um, exercises today, I would build up a concept to really like make topic by topic in a bit deeper way but for today i wanted to have a kind of overall um okay. impression wonderful so we are looking at the game between boris pasky and yuri averbach right exactly and the last move from black was b takes c4 and i mean this is a very short exercise all i want from you now is to propose me a move and here is okay. just one move in the position, which is clearly the strongest move. Okay. And have a look, think for a couple of minutes, and then tell me what okay. you think. Do you mind? Uh, do you want me to actually describe my thought process? Um, yes, you can describe your thought process, but you can also like first start to have a look for yourself, okay. and then tell me like your thought process as you like. Okay. All right, so we're going to do the usual. I don't see any checks in this position. Actually, there aren't any checks, period. Uh, I'm not seeing any significant. Actually, there are no captures in this position. Very good, yeah. Um, the, there, are there are possibility of threats, and one candidate move here is to play e5, mm -hmm. which is a threat against the strongest, uh, you know, black piece outside of the king and this is also a pawn breakthrough so that's one obvious candidate move um, and very frankly that looks like a best move in this position um, I'll, you know another oh. alternative is to place to basically remove the knight from the d file and play something like knight f3 because uh that i'm not sure that this pawn on on d6 can be defended and you know white can then follow it up with e5 and then basically this knight is going to end up being permanently unplaced on the sixth you know so all right so i think we have those two candidate moves um, can you maybe like watch out perhaps for a third candidate move which could also make some sense okay. if you well for example like here in white's position Mm -hmm. If you move the knight away, you know that d6 is going to be weak. Yes. What could be weak for you once you move that knight away in terms of what black could try to attack in exchange sure. to the weakness on d6? Uh, well, that the removal of the knight opens the diagonal to b2, which basically renders this pawn weak. Yes, and what other kind okay. of diagonal could be accessible after you remove the knight? And this, where the king is placed. Also, in yeah. terms of weaknesses, we speak yeah. only of b2. What other pawn could be easier attacked yes. once you remove the knight? f4, not necessarily, because it's not connected. I mean, the queen currently presses on f4. If I move the knight or not, 
the queen would still press on it for. But what other piece of black could press on another pawn once you move the knight away? Uh, we're talking about pawn on b2, right? Or we're this is already one, but there's another one. Which there is can another pawn. Play. Okay. Huh, good question. Um, well, black can... Mm, all right. Another pawn that can be attacked is basically is the pawn on h3 if the if the queen goes to g6. Yes. Uh, and all the other pawns <clears throat> are basically defended. E4 is defended. E4 is defended, right. But once you move the knight away, there's bishop c6 and rook e8 as a counterattack against the weakness on c6, uh, d6. Yes, uh, the pawn on e4. Mm -hmm. And that's, yeah, okay. So your first suggestion was e5, right? From your yes. intuitional point of view. Yes. But what is the benefit you get from e5? Or what is the benefit maybe even black gets from your move e5? Well, uh, e5 uh, basically gets black rid of the pawn on d6, exactly. which, is, which is weak. Uh, the thing here is that once uh, once d6 pawn disappears the uh, the and you know if we move the knight the bishop on d7 becomes uh, becomes weak it's an undefended piece this is true but that means already like then if you push e5 we either have a tactical trick against the bishop on d7 Otherwise, we give black basically just one plus, and the plus is exchanging the weakest pawn against one of your central pawns, besides allowing the queen to get to b6 on a better diagonal. Yep. And that already means that, objectively speaking, unless there is a tactical mm -hmm. trick, which probably you don't see now because there is nothing as a, of a tactical trick, you give with a move e5, your opponent only pluses. Correct. And uh, I am not sure I can take advantage of the fact that bishop on d7 is undefended. Yes. That means if you play a move like e5, it has a tactical approach. But if you don't see anything concrete to exploit the yeah. hanging piece on d7, the move from the positional point of view is actually not a clever one. Okay, agreed. Thank you. Uh, all right. So what other options do I have? We we have just concluded that e five is uh, is too too direct. It's too direct, and it doesn't give you anything because we cannot exploit the hanging piece okay. on d seven. All right. So I think we I can still look at the knight f three as a candidate move, right? Yes, but with knight f three, also like what you already mentioned, is yeah. that maybe b two could be an issue. And mm -hmm. the other issue is that bishop c6 and rook e8 are moves which anyway are in the air. Correct. Okay. All right. So that uh, eliminates both of those moves. Yes. But I mean, like, you are right about your intuition to suggest a knight move. Absolutely right. Because it feels like that the knight on d4 is a strong piece. But it doesn't help you in any case because you want to hit on d6. Yeah. And you want also to have a stability with your pawn on b2. Okay. And if I combine these two thoughts, I would get a third candidate move here, which is not obvious, but which makes perfectly sense. Okay. Well, the that candidate move is... Um, all right, so we basically need to reinforce the potential weakness on e4. And also to protect indirectly the pawn on b2. If you take the knight in your hand mm -hmm. and you would take it on a, a square of your choice, what square would it be in order to give stability to e4 and to indirectly like uh, remove the pressure on b2? Uh, well, we can put the knight on... <clears throat> hey, Dirk, it's very good to see you. Welcome to the uh, Nicolas Chess with Ellie Pecht. It's very good to see you guys. And this 
I know that Ricky was gonna come in. He uh, Ali doesn't know it. He enjoys watching me be tortured by tortured by my coaches. So this <laughs> promises to be a very interesting session. All right. So basically, what we can do is we can do the night maneuver to e two and c three. Absolutely correct. Yes, and, and this is quite yeah. strong. Okay, and that's probably the and what that does is first it defend defends the pawn on e four and then and blocks this diagonal. Okay. Absolutely. So and the I mean just if you if you move knight e two for example bishop mm -hmm. c six now knight c three. Yep. And we see okay we still have this as a potential weakness. I mean it's hanging now. We still keep an option on e5, even so we would prefer to do something about this pawn. And we have a very simple plan. Queen f2, rook d4, rook d1, and hitting on that two guys. And at some point, the pressure will be too strong. Okay. And that's what basically happened in the game. For us, this is not interesting anymore. Interesting was about the first maneuver, because this will prepare you for the next exercise, I will just build okay. up. Thank you. I don't know if you can remove the um, the notation in 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 your chess.com. There should be an option. Masha said me last time she could remove it. The notation. Yes, I mean like the income notation. If you cannot, I will just uh, put the pic uh, the, the position as an fn. F, F E N file, but uh, F E N file. Um, hmm. There is a kind of uh, arrow where you can click for the notation, and if you click it away, you shouldn't see the income notation. Uh, okay, so I'm not supposed to see the 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 actual moves on the on the side, right? Yes, the notation of the of the of the game. Yes, because then uh, you know okay. the the right move. And there should be this kind of arrow. You click on notation. I think it's this arrow, and you shouldn't be able to see it. Okay. Um, let me see here. No, that moves the. Hmm. Okay. I'm I'm less proficient here with this. Uh, okay, what no I can do is I can go away. I can basically hide that tab. Yes, this is also fine. Okay. Yeah, I'm gonna just hide that tab, and then we can. I can just look. Yeah, that's fine. So now it should come in the position. Yep, I see it. It's uh, Karpo versus Baske. Yes, it's one of the most impressive games I have seen in my life of Karpov. But you don't know it, right? Or you know it? I don't know it, no. Okay. All right. Very so good. So here, in this position, let me just briefly say something. Um, if you look at all the pieces, in um, that position, white and black, it would make sense for you in order to get like an idea about the right move to look at the pluses you have for white and maybe also on the minuses in terms of piece activity, which of your pieces are good here, which could be improved, what is the weakness you may aim for or which has potentially some kind of attacking chances in the future. I mean, what plex weakness we can try to attack. And then maybe the move for you will be a bit easier. Okay. All right. Let me give that a try. And famous visitor, thank you for stopping by. It's very good to see you. And the, the shelp, uh, thank you. That's, those are very kind words. Welcome, welcome to the stream. Uh, Okay, all right, so. Uh, all right, so looks like by the, on the face of it, that the advantages for white in this position is that he looks like he will be able to control the D file. Yes, this is, True. However, let's assume I yeah. play rook d1. I could try to play rook yeah. takes d2 followed by rook d8, and all the rooks would be exchanged. Sure. Then there is this um, pin on f7. Very good. That's uh, hey, Hawker2100. Thank you for joining the stream. Uh, all right. So that's. Obviously, pawn on f7 is a weakness. Uh, 
Mm -hmm. uh, I would venture to say that white bishop is better than the black one. Uh, well, kind of, yes. Even though the black bishop on h4 is doing a very interesting job, it yeah. controls like a very sensible, like or like a very sensitive square g5, which for now is not important. But if yeah. hypothetically that knight could aim for that square, it is very important piece to get some control on it. Okay, so... All right, very good. So what other pluses? The pawn on c6 is, uh, is a problem with a, with a black pawn structure. In other words, it's an, it's an identified weakness. Mm -hmm. um, so basically, I have pawns on f7 and c6. Yes. And... Um, you know, the knight on b4 looks nice, but it's really not doing anything. Kind of true. Even so, there is maybe the threat of capturing on d2 and then capturing on c2. Correct. Yeah, yeah. And um, white queen is very active. So, you know, those are... I'm not seeing any other plus for white here. I mean, you can argue that the white queen, uh, white king is safer than the black king. This is actually true. The white king objectively is safer than the yeah. black king because f7 is a huge problem in this position. Another question, actually, which is always good to ask yourself, what is better for you as exactly in this position to keep both rooks on the board or to exchange one of the rook because Currently, with a rook on d2 and the rook on d8, there could be the, the discussion that one rook may be swapped off. Okay. So That's... what could be better for you, to allow the exchange or even to avoid the exchange? That's actually an interesting question that I'm not sure how to answer. The... Okay. Uh exchange if we exchange the the pawn on f7 which is identified weakness can realistically only be attacked by the queen and the both rooks absolutely yes so yeah so if we were to consider that part of our long-term plan it's uh, it's to our advantage to um, it's to our it's to our advantage to not to exchange the rooks. Yes, objectively you're right. In yeah. general, like if you can keep the rook, mm -hmm. then it's later on, especially for example, if we manage something like let's say g three yep. to have not this problem rook f two, we could really increase yeah. the pressure on. Um, f7, especially because a bishop doesn't have good squares. On e7, it would avoid the protection on f7. And on f6, it's also shaky because of the doubling of the rooks. So let me, let me, let me think along more lines here. The, we have objectively one weakness that black is attacking, which is this pawn on c2. Yep, and what do you think is the weakest piece in white? Uh, it's the knight on c3. It's really it's being dominated by the pawn on c6. Very S good. So some sort of uh, and so some sort of a long-term strategic plan would be to play knight e2. Mm -hmm. Put push this pawn maybe on c3 to kick the knight out. Uh, maybe play g3, which might be a weakening move to get rid of this bishop. And then uh, actually get this rook over to f2 and basically play against this pawn. I mean, everything you said is absolutely correct. But let me ask you a question. If you bring the knight to e2, what future perspective would the knight on e2 have? Um, 
none because it's really it's probably gonna end up being dominated by the pawn on e5 absolutely correct also like for example if he would play knight e2 now then black would first of all capture on d2 which means that the whole coordination is a bit struggling as also the bishop on e3 has to leave the diagonal and if you look just from the harmony mm. of peter's point of view somehow knight e2 looks wrong I but you're already getting in the right direction it is something connected about the knight so the question here is, all right, so, you know, how do we improve that knight on c3? Where, if we could put the knight somewhere, where would we put the knight? And the obvious there, you know, we can put it on c5, but it's not immediately obvious how the knight can get there. And, um, you know, I actually have watched Karpov play for since I was you know since I was eight years old so I'm pretty sure I can guess what he played the question here is if we conclude that uh, it's to our benefit to not exchange rooks then we need to play rookie two you are right about this. Just the thing is like, that is of course a right thought, but if you play rook e2, we don't improve the position of our knight. And what Karpov did with all what we already learned about the position, he made the move, which basically made the exchange of the rook for our opponent super unattractive. Okay. Then if for example, like you can take the knight into your hand. You say like perhaps c5, but you already like concluded that the knight on c5 is not doing any harm. If you take the knight into your hand and you can put it on another square, what square would currently in this position be the most inconvenient square for black? Okay. Uh, all right. So... Um... Uh, Rahul Chess, thank you for joining. Yes, we're we looking at the position of a game between Anatoly Karpov and Boris Paske. Um, I don't know the details. Okay, so basically, based on what you said, is this is the plan? All right, let me let me see if I I thought this through properly. Uh, we need this knight to go onto the king side. Knight e2, it's dominated. If we play knight b1, we have avoided the. Uh, you know, we we are improving the knight. We are. We, if he captures on t, we're going to capture with the knight, and then we're going to kind of slowly aim to go to f3 to kick the bishop out. And then that bishop uh, probably will have a hard time going to g5. And if he goes on f6, we're going to have a battery of rooks. And then if the rooks are not exchanged, we're going to play rook f2. And then we're hitting this pawn very hard. This knight is a little bit of trouble because we can play c3. This pawn is still weak but cannot be pushed. And we have improved our position. That yes, sounds like good. a plan. That sounds like the right move. Knight b1 was played because A, he understood the knight is misplaced. B, he keeps the stability of the coordination of pieces because the exchange on d2 would result only in an improvement of the knight. He has the idea of pressing c3 to give the knight on b4 a kind of bad uh, coordination. And at some point, he might bring the knight over d2 to f3 and to really be annoying against the defender of the black squares, the bishop on h4. Okay. So knight b1 was played and black answered with queen b7, prophylactically already protecting the pawn on c6. Now the next move is again a very typical Kapovian move, we can say, because we already understood at some point we want to get the knight to f3 and perhaps um, the rook to f2. And then we said we get the knight to f3, 
then we already understood that the bishop on h4 has not so many squares. But currently, what square is the most attractive one, hypothetically, once we place the knight on f3? For the bishop, black bishop? For the bishop, yes, for the bishop, for the black bishop, which square he would obviously take in order also to indirectly protect f7. Uh, he can play bishop g3. Absolutely correct. He would play bishop g3 and then rook f2 is not that easy anymore. So knowing the fact that he is planning to get his knight to f3 at some point, what did Karpov do if he understands that the best square of the bishop could be g3? This is very uh, five head positional play. So he played king h2. He played king h2 because already prophylactically in his head, he had the picture of knight d2, knight f3 and rook f2 in his mind. And he knew the only thing currently disturbing him could be bishop g3. So he played king h2. And now, of course, like black decided not to capture on d2 because it's psychologically very hard to support the ideas of your opponent. Even so, exchanging that rook might have been better in terms of suffering less on f7. Black played, however, king g7. And now this was a moment for Karpov to use his chance. And I will not tell you what chance, otherwise the move is so obvious, but to use his chance to get everything he wants however, in a slow way. Okay. All right. So let me think for a second. All right. So going the old, so long-term strategic plan is for Knight to go on F3. I yes. think that plan still applies. Mm -hmm. Long-term, we, you know, I think, rookie two is one option but what uh, you know and i'm not sure that g3 is not a viable move because that bishop the black bishop is fairly limited with where it can go because it cannot go to g5 if it goes on f6 uh, there is rook f2 and that bishop is immediate trouble well, but if I play g3, I would first capture on d2, obviously. Otherwise, yeah. I would lose immediately. Yes, and then you, can, you have bishop d8. So g3 is too direct. Mm -hmm. um, we can play, we can slow play this and just play rook e2, knight d2, knight f3, and then continue yes. with the plan as an outline. So, and that sounds like, um, and I don't see any positional counterplay on the d file for for black so rookie two is a natural move that's basically what he did he first played c3 but that's just an intermediate move which makes sense and now he went for rook e2 which is a key move in this position yeah because as you already mentioned i keep both rooks on the board which is very crucial later on for f7 and now i have a very well Obvious plan, I bring the knight to f3 and the situation for black and especially the king side gets much worse. Okay. So black went for rook f8, knight d2, now bishop d8. The next move is also clear, knight f3 and f6. Now it was time for Karpov, well, basically like to change his plans because okay now f7 he cannot hit on anymore but with f6 what did become weak in black's position what do you think nicola okay well f6 pawn is still weak but that's not uh, immediately obvious uh, black in the process lost lost uh, control on the d file so that's uh, you know, we can attempt to take advantage of it. The knight is kind of stuck on a6. Uh -huh. And, you know, this is uh, obviously, uh, I mean, vastly 
proved, I mean, we have provoked a weakness and on top of it, Black King is now much more exposed than it was a few minutes ago. Yes, uh, Diagonal became very weak as well. Yeah. So what would be your move here by intuition, Nicola? Uh, by intuition, uh, I would I would probably try to play... Okay, so I don't want to lose this bishop because I need it for the attack on the king. So I want to put the rook on d file. Very good. That's exactly what... Um, but I don't want to play uh, rook d2 because then rook, uh, bishop b6 and then I am in trouble with this bishop. So I will play rook d1. Wait, if you play rook d2 and bishop b6, do you think that tactically he can play bishop b6 in this position? No. Uh, no, no, he can't. He's going to get mated very soon. Duh, I mean, either queen e6 or bishop takes b6. I'm not sure in which order, but I don't think no, that's it's, like it's, the way. It's, it, it doesn't work. All right, so... All right, so we we need to... I mean, we're going to put both rooks on the file anyway. So Yes, but he started... Which rook would make more sense to start with to bring on the d file? Hey, Alessia Santeramo, thank you for... Thank you for the thank you for the big raid. Very greatly appreciated. Welcome to the stream. Welcome raiders. I am I'm having a regular session of Nicola Studies Chess with one and only international master um, uh, Elizabeth Pecht, uh, better known as Miss Messi. <laughs> and a huge shout out to Alessia. I think all of you know who Alessia is. She's a dear friend of the channel. She's a dear friend of mine. And she was also known as Marge Simpson. So just give her a huge shout out. Well, thank you, Alessia. And welcome, welcome Raiders. Um, okay. So to get back. No, you're welcome. Thanks, Alessia. Uh, the pact's punishment for Nicola, exactly. Thanks. Thank you, Dirk. So which rook it makes sense to move here? Okay. In other words, the question is whether rook d1 makes more sense than rook d2. Um, all right. So... The good question is, what's the difference? Well, I mean, just, uh, I mean, the easiest way to ask, to answer this question is like, what rook does what currently? So the rook on e2 is doing what, the rook on f1 is doing what. And if you just ask yourself this question, it's yeah. quite logical which rook you would move. No, we need rook to on e2 to keep defending the pawn on b2. So that's that's one reason to play the rook uh, rook d1 in this position but if i play rook d2 my rook is still protecting the pawn on b2 besides Correct. do you believe that black would have time to afford queen takes b2 when his seventh no. rank and e6 square is almost crying for help no and the, the the big problem with f6 was that it completely uh, exposed all the white of the light squares here yes in addition with a very yeah. weak seventh rank it yeah. is okay so so we are playing rook d2 yes also like you know at some point there might be tactical tricks with knight takes e5 connected to um rook takes f8 so for this reason already it makes sense to not bring the F rook, but the E rook into the game. And besides knight takes E5 in this position actually might already be considerable, but it's not yet enough, but these motives still already exist because you have to calculate taking on F8, bishop H6 check. So you already get your pieces yeah. into it, but okay, it's premature, but it's nice to keep that option. Okay. Yeah, I understood that. That makes sense. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So bishop uh, rook d2 was played, bishop e7. What could be the next move to improve the position? Okay. All right. 
right so let me think for a second here uh move number one is all right so let, let's do let's revert to the good old checks captures and everything else uh hey Dirke, thank you for gifting a tier one sub to chess noob very greatly appreciated and chess noob congratulations yet again on getting a lifetime subscription in alessia's channel that's a huge honor and that's uh uh, you and you should be proud that's uh, that's a unique uh, very unique uh, award okay so the so we still have we we have exactly i mean we have a couple of captures but the only i don't we don't have any meaningful captures uh frets wise okay what can we do here is I mean we can double the rook and threaten d7 rook one of the penet getting one of the rooks on d7 we can take advantage of the weakness of the e6 square and play uh, queen e6 which uh -huh. actually opens several tactical motives including capturing on e5 yep and that looks like a fairly strong candidate move, actually. Yes, so if you can choose between queen e6 or rook d1, which of those two moves make more sense? Or is queen by e6. your intuition stronger? Yeah, queen e6 uh, it generates more threats. Yes, queen e6 is stronger because, okay, after rook d1, perhaps there's still rook d8. And if I can get rid of all of our rooks, then my king is a lot safer with queen e6 however you have to be very careful already of kind of tactical threats connected to knight takes e5 yeah so now after queen e6 however rook d8 was played and now karpov used of course this tactical trick in a way that he could do something here which um would weaken significantly the seventh rank in an indirect way. Okay. So knight takes e5 immediately here doesn't work, but he could play something which then would give black only one reply, which is important here in this position. More I can't say, otherwise I'm no, no, so I understand. Up. Okay. All right, so we do want to play knight e5 at some point um mm -hmm. let me think for a second okay we want to get the rook on we want to keep the rook on f1 for tactic for the purpose of that tactics however um if uh, if this rook wasn't on d8 uh, we would be able to this would be almost an immediately crushing position yes yeah, so if you can get one rook to d7 yeah. of course then it's over so we have a motive to play bishop b6 at some point yeah, okay, this bishop b6, I can react with rook takes d2, and after knight takes d2... No, it doesn't work now, that. but, mm -hmm. that it, it, that's, you know. But we can exchange one pair of rooks and play that. I'm not saying that's the move I want to play, I'm just thinking loud, so... Okay. Actually, like, you are right when you always consider the capturing variations first. So yeah. rook takes d8, of course, makes sense. So what is the reply of black after rook takes d8? Uh, rook on actually the all right all right so capturing on d8 let me get this arrow off and thank you for it superman for the follow that's very greatly appreciated thank you all right so rook d8 here can either the natural capture with a rook but that that basically makes sacrifice on e5 immediately active so basically uh -huh. on rook d8 i don't think black can take with that with a rook 
because then yeah. we play 95 and we are i think winning mm -hmm. so it needs to capture with a bishop and and if he captures with a bishop then we can play rook d1 and and the position for black will basically collapse, we'll collapse. yeah yes and that's what happened he right. took on b8 he played rook d1 mm -hmm. now the last way of avoiding rook d7 was knight b8 Ouch. and here two more moves were played and black resigned okay let me think for a second we have an option of playing it all right so checks we don't have any meaningful checks that i can see i don't see any meaningful captures i don't see any meaningful attack against the black king the black queen but we can play bishop c5 very good intuition because uh, bishop c5 is a natural move yeah. attacking the rook and also like bringing the bishop into the attack yeah and that's I think is that that's the move I would play in this position. This is very good. So I mean, after bishop c5, let's assume I play rook h8. What is then the execution after rook h8? Okay. Uh, and black for... resigned already. Okay. Uh, let's see. We can. Uh, what we can we then take on e5? Let me think for a second. Um, <laughs> we can, I think, can we? No, we don't have a follow up. Hey, Matt Quick Chess, thank you for the follow. Thank you for joining us, and thank you, Danny of Chess Lions. It's good to see you. Uh, if you guys haven't haven't already give uh, give a follow to Chess Lions, he's a great streamer and a great friend. Um, all right, so <clears throat> all right, so we played Bishop C five, Rook H eight. Uh -huh. um, what do we do here? Hmm. Yeah, I, I what you should always calculate first, what right. you already do. Yeah, the checks. Okay, there's no checks. There so are no what is checks. And we have a capture on e5, which may work or may not. I'm not sure yet. It, what other capture do we have? Um, let's see. Okay, so. What other capture do we have? We can we can capture on d eight. Uh -huh. And we can capture on d eight is and we don't have I mean capture c six doesn't it's obviously meaningless. All right. So capture d eight, rook takes on d eight. Um if we play, then what's the follow up? Is there a follow up? What does a bishop on the eight do? We can do, yeah, we, we want to, we can play bishop e7. Uh huh, and that was enough reason for uh, Spassky to resign. And that's, that's, that's mate, yeah. Okay. It's not made, but you lose like all the pawns basically yeah. because yeah. rook f8 is yeah. the only way not to lose yeah. everything. But okay, he played rook e8 and he took, and some attacks were coming, but basically this position is ready to resign. Yeah. Okay, then mm -hmm. we go for the next position. This was basically about maneuvering. This is an interesting position. Yeah, okay. So now we go into another section and we will start modestly. Okay. It's similar to maneuvering, but it's a bit different, however. Thank you, Coltel, for the follow. Very greatly appreciated. This is the inaugural session of Nicola Learns Chess with one and only international master Elizabeth Pecht. 
better known as Miss Messy. Oh God. Okay. Activating your pieces one. Okay. Versus Boris Spassky. Okay. Hmm. It's similar to maneuvering, of course, but it's yet a bit different. Okay. So let's have a look at the position. Nicola, what do you know when you are playing with the isolated pawn on d5? Because certain rules sometimes can help. Okay. Well, the, 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 it's obviously a possible target. The field in front of it, d4, is weak and it's beneficial for us to put a piece on it, ideally a knight. In exchange, mm -hmm. usually black this, the black gets a free flow of pieces and f in free play of pieces and uh, some sort of a development compensation. And that sounds about it. Yeah, so basically when we have an isolated pawn, it is, of course, better to keep pieces on the board. The more pieces yeah. you exchange, the weaker gets your pawn on d5 and as already you said since the pawn the isolated pawn doesn't have friends yeah. on the c and e file it also means that usually the files can be used here it's the e file which black can use the c file he doesn't use so much because it's anyway blocked by the own bishop okay. so what if you look at this position what do you think is our weakest piece uh, we are white. Okay. No, we are black. We are black. You have to. Oh, we are uh, black. Okay. You are black. Yeah. Then, it, do you mind if I flip the board? Oh, you should. Flip. I, I already flipped the board. I saw it automatically flipping your board, but now I understand it's not. Okay. All right. So, so we are black, black here. Okay. So we're Spassky. Yeah. Okay. Um, hmm. Our weakest piece is uh, probably this bishop on d seven. Uh huh. Which is not, which is basically biting. It's biting, and it's pawn, this pawn on d five. Mm -hmm. uh, the hmm, the disadvantage of this pos the advantage of black in this position is that uh, all its pieces are, are kind of aggressively placed, and there is a possibility of attack. Uh, yes, what kind of tactical motive you may spot in this position, which doesn't work currently, but which yeah. may work. Yeah, knight f2. Very good, knight f2. For now, it doesn't work because mainly the knight on d4 is the betrayer to stop anything connected to taking on e3. Yes. Okay, so... And... All right, so let me see something. Um, and obviously, queen queen defends queen defends the the e three. So if we play knight f two and takes, then queen is defending. Um, the question here is, and I'm just thinking loud. Uh, can we play? this to deflect the queen at some point we can also maybe do a little bit of pawn push here i'm not sure what that would achieve um in other words the question is we for this attack to be effective ask uh, Care at 21, my rating is somewhere with uh, in between 1900 and 2000 uh, in, on chess.com. And, you know, my official rating is 1597, but that was based only on three games that I played USCF. All right, so. All right, so if you play bishop a6, takes on a6, knight f2, we have given one check, and how do we follow up, and can we follow up? It's actually very 
useful if we play h3 first because then the bishop on f3 will become undefended. The knight on d4 would still protect, however, that bishop. Correct, unfortunately, which we cannot displace with a pawn. Um, hmm. All right, so I'm just going to think of a sequence and obviously that's, it's not going to work because if we play the h3, bishop a6, takes knight f2, rook e3, and we cannot take on d4 because it's going to take with a knight and we cannot take the bishop on f3 and we have sacrificed two pieces and it doesn't work okay so we don't have immediate tactics unless i don't see it so we need to exactly. so we need to figure out a way to displace the one of the knights okay so Dirk actually suggested uh, playing rook a8 and then playing bishop on a6 and she is absolutely and right is about absolutely that. Right. Okay. So we're gonna start there. Good. Good catch, Drukia. So rook a. Oh, I don't want to make move. Okay. So we're making rook a8 move. Yes. I mean the difficulty about rook a8 move is basically that somehow in your mindset to get the rook, which is already like in the center, back to the original square where it yeah. started from, is very tough. But to understand that the bishop on this diagonal a6 f1 would be huge yep. is is that important that you can even afford to make a kind of backwards move in order to enable it because yep. after rook a8 the position actually almost collapses the best move here for white and this is already said news would be to capture on e4 yeah. But this means that after d takes e4, we get just the bishop pair, a much better pawn structure, and we have a nice advantage, despite we have even more space advantage as we had before. White played a4, bishop a6, and here the problem is that knight b5 does not work. And why it doesn't work yet anymore? Okay. Hmm, good question. Let me think for a second. Um, okay. Um, hmm. Let me think. All right. It doesn't work because... Hmm. What's the concrete plan? All right. No checks. Capturing on b5 is doesn't work. It's a tactical motive. Uh, right? What other thing we can capture? We can capture on f2. Uh, Oliverius TV. That motive is still there, and then we can take with a bishop. But let me think here. Do we play, if we play h3 first to prevent, because now knight on d, there is no knight defending the bishop. <laughs> All right, I'm... First, calculate the concrete lines. This makes always sense. Okay. So knight takes f2, king f2, bishop takes e3, the king goes to f1 or e1. What could be the follow-up, if there's a follow-up? The follow-up is to take on h2, and then we are threatening a direct mate, which is actually yes. pretty hard to defend, and that's why Indeed. this doesn't work. Exactly. I mean, okay. that's yeah. why I asked you at the beginning of the tactical motive, because once this knight is leaving, then the whole issue on e3 is just working for black. So knight f2, bishop e3, queen h2, and okay, white is just lost. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
And the problem was that after bishop a6, queen b3, black wins material here. And that is quite obvious how, I guess. Uh, okay. Well, we can, we are trap we, we can trap the queen. We yes, play bishop, bishop c4, c4 is trapping. and we win the exchange and, and we win the uh, exchange and the game. Yeah. Yeah. Very good. So now the next position is coming up. No, this was not the one I initiated. One second. It comes here. Yeah. So coming in one second and you are oh. white. Okay. Thank you, Nisokas, for the follow. Greatly appreciated. Okay. Let me flip the board. Okay. And in this position, rook b4 was played and it is white to move. Okay. Okay. All right. So. All right. So no checks. No checks. Period. Oh, thank you, Paul in New Jersey, for the follow. Very greatly appreciated. Thank you. All right. So we have a capture on f7 that is not meaningful. We have a capture on c7, which is not meaningful either and we don't have any other captures therefore we can clear that out um, we have we I don't see any threats against either the rook or the queen we have one pawn push which is f5 which may or may not be the right move. Actually, that looks somewhat appealing. Um, black doesn't have any immediate threats that I can see. Mm -hmm. um, so, so we can all right, so if the sequence is we play f5, black takes, we take, we're losing the pawn on b3, which is a problem. But... Another question is perhaps that after yeah. f5, I could have some other moves like queen f2 at some moment, maybe not exactly there's also yeah. rook takes e4 and queen takes e5 the exchange sacrifice which could be interesting yeah. but of course f5 is one of the candidates but let's look if you have more than that candidate here in this position okay so um what is our i mean are we we have a pawn on b3 that is weak mm -hmm. um we probably we are controlling the we're controlling the the d file that control is not going to cha be challenged this knight on c4 looks pretty but it's not doing anything because we want to attack so uh so another candidate move would be to transition that knight, say, to e4 when he can some nasty jumps. So we can maybe uh -huh. play knight d2, that reinforces b3, and we threaten to play knight e4 with a tempo. And after we play there, then we, you know, we get the knight on f4, we are in good shape. So that's another candidate to move. Um, what else do we have? I mean, we can play queen f3 to attack that pawn on h5, but that's kind of too slow. Why but, do you think actually like queen f3 would be too slow? Or maybe not. You know, no, I'm just I'm just thinking loud. Okay. Um, 
All right, we basically do not want to allow black to put the queen on e, uh, queen on e3 and exchange queen. So I think playing knight d2 immediately might be a little bit premature. So we have exactly one threat, which is this queen f3, which means that's a candidate move. Uh -huh. And uh, hmm. <laughs> okay. Okay, um, let's think from a totally different angle. What do you think? Which of your pieces here is the one who is not yet doing anything? We have two pieces that are kind of not doing much. Um, hey, Lila Kuridza, thank you for raiding with a party of 78. Welcome, raiders. Uh, welcome, Lila. Thank you. A big shout out to Lila Kuridza. Um, and uh, to, she's a friend, a streamer. And it's always good to see her. And she's one of the strongest female uh, lady players on Twitch. Um, welcome Raiders, this is an irregular session of Nikola Stadis Chess with one and only international master Elizabeth Pechts. There is an Ellie command here, so please give Ellie a follow. She is known as Lizzie and also as Miss Messi, which I somehow find very comforting because I'm messy too. So, thank you. All right, so... <laughs> Yes, it's it's going great. Thank you. I have it's very good to see you here, Lila, again. All right, so here um, we I mean Queen H five is obviously a legitimate threat, and uh, it also is a way for a white queen, a queen to kind of escape from a possible exchange, you know, queen exchange because we I think in this position we want a queens we want to keep the queens on the board. We are attacking. All right, so, so what is the what? piece which is not doing much yet? The knight. Well, the knight actually on c four is controlling important squares and has not right. such a bad place. Um, well, we have and rook d one, rook two rooks are controlling the d file. Uh, mm -hmm. It's I think it's actually the queen. Well, the queen actually is not that bad too, because okay, we have rook d8 yeah. ideas at some point. I mean, like why I'm asking this is like, okay, you, this is very typical human because okay, you see always all the pieces, but you forget always about one piece, which you may not forget in the end game, but which you like intuitively. Oh, are, okay, so we're going to, we're going to play with our king as uh, I think Dirk should have this, should have this lesson. This is second time in a row that he actually made the right suggestion. All right, so we're, we're gonna play with our king. So here king h4 is actually a quite nice candidate move because okay, why to like maneuver? I mean, queen f3 is actually according to the engine stronger, but this is not the, the, the idea about this exercise. It's the idea is to like also like stop this automatism that the king in the middle game is not necessarily a piece sure. we can use. Okay. All right, so that's fine. And if uh, black plays queen f2, we have h3 and it's... No, but after queen f2, we have, I think, even rook d2. Rook d2 Don't is probably better, it. yeah. This mm. is much better. And okay, the problem is like that if now g6, that's what happened in the game. The king goes to g5 yeah. and king g7 is not possible anymore as we have queen takes g6 coming. Okay, nice. So after rook d8, the king went to h6, and then, okay, at some point, um, white won the game because the king on h6 is very safe. <laughs> and at some <laughs> okay. point, there will be some kind of sacrifices. Um, I will Sparta. show you. There you go. Okay. I will briefly show you one of the most famous examples on that. I just thought, like, you might know it. That's why it was more of a kind of test in a way as well. You must have seen Nigel Short against Timman or not. Have uh, you ever seen that one? I don't think so. One second, I will just bring it here. Must be among my 
my things. And this is the example where when you have seen that once, you would always consider it as a kind of um, way of activating your pieces. Okay. This is the, one of the most famous examples exactly about the same issue. Just here in this yes. position, it's much yeah, more. This, yeah, I've seen this actually. Yeah. Mm. And that's why I saw like if I show you this, then the yeah. other example is becoming too easy. No, this is this is this is a little obvious. Yeah. yeah. Here it's obvious because you understand the knight cannot move and g4 is not that easy to do yeah. because of f3, and then you go with the king. Yeah. In here. Okay. Next example. One okay. second. Now we go into something very different, I would say. Different topic. If you have seen it, just please always let me know because yeah, sometimes course. it course. can happen that certain examples are very famous. And then, oops, yeah. That's the next position for White, and White was Smyslov against Reshevsky. Okay. All right, very good. I am not familiar with this position. Okay. Okay. All right, so material is equal, white mm -hmm. has a bishop pair and advantage in development. Yes. Um, yeah, fearless mastering, that's an option. There are no checks. I mean, we don't want to take on e6, at least not immediately. Um, okay, so. What do you think is the biggest problem in Black's position, or what are the biggest problems of Black's position? Well, it's lack of development. Yes, that's one. And the other oh, one? It's pawn on d6. Very good. That are these two big issues Black yeah. has. Yes. Which means if we allow Black to develop, like knight d7, for example, or knight c6, especially knight e7 as it comes with a tempo, then I'm very quick in getting all my things in order because the knight will go to f6, we will hit on e4, and then my rook can also play. Yeah, yeah we have an initiative advantage that's somewhat perishable. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks, Fearless Mustang. Let me, let me figure this out. He's uh, okay. Okay. That may actually work. All right, so one suggested move in chat is to play f4. Okay, let's assume we play f4. Okay. What is Black likely doing as the first thing we should consider? Which move? Uh, At least in Blitz, I would probably instantly play it after f4 because I would already feel a little bit relieved. <laughs> yeah, you can play knight d7. Yes, knight d7 with the tempo. I also have like e5 under control. And if you play even a move like f5, you know, guys, you're playing with the bishop pair. It's not like that you open up the position. You rather close it in a way. Okay. Yes. So that's... Uh... That doesn't work, which means that, uh, you know, and f thing is, if we be being, if we give black to Tempai, he is going to be fine. Hey, 2511, it's very good to see you. And thank you, Sabrina Hodger, for coming. It's very greatly appreciated. Welcome to the stream. Uh, so if the knight wasn't on E6. Mm-hmm. Uh, then knight d7 no longer works because we have bishop c7. That could be a way of looking at it. 
if yeah. I ask you now a question which you should, should which actually as a must you should try to always ask yourself in a mm -hmm. position especially when you don't know what to do what is the strongest piece of plaque in this position it's knight on e6 why do you think it's a knight on e6 what does a knight actually do on e6 to make it the strongest piece it's um... Um, it prevents uh, bishop c7 if when we play knight d7, for example. Yes, but this is true. But on the other hand, like, okay, in the worst case, I have knight c6 upcoming, but we can anyway not do much about the knight on e6 currently because, okay, we can exchange it, but Maybe. otherwise we cannot do much. Correct. But what is the most important piece? Maybe not the strongest, but the most important piece in black's position, which to me, makes it also the strongest piece in Black's position, because without that piece, the whole stability of Black is broken on the spot. We're talking about Queen on e7 that's defending d6? Absolutely, because you know that if d6 yeah. is falling, the game is over. Yes. Mm -hmm. So if we understand that this piece is responsible for the stability of Black's camp, how like what sort we should automatically have in this moment now we need to displace the queen displace or exchange uh-huh yes to exchange okay. that queen because if you know we exchange the queen then d6 is falling on the spot no matter if there's knight d7 or not we have rook takes d6 to come okay um all right uh, that's very understood. So queen h4 is probably too direct. Okay, queen h4 already is like a kind of t-square in this position because we know if the queens would exchange, we would win on d6 and we have a winning endgame. What is the problem about queen h4 now? We're kind of ruining our own pawn structure if the black exchange. And also, you know, black can even play f6. So I don't think the, the most direct route is the right way to go. So, okay, I mean, with queen h4, about the pawn structure, it's actually a kind of automatic sort, which is not true, because even if you have g takes h4, we have a bad pawn structure, but we win on d6. And then, I mean, look at all the pieces. Okay. Besides that also b7 gets weak. I mean, we would win a crucial pawn and we would just dominate the queen side. But what is more important is that after queen h4, there is at least, as you already mentioned, two ways of preventing the idea. One is f6. The other one, however, is knight g5. Yes. So that already, f6 and knight g5 should get us into the direction of what to do first before we execute with queen h4. What move you should consider here first? If uh, f6 and knight g5 might be the problem. f4. Well, no, f4. Actually, then after f4, I have once again knight d7. You don't have time for queen h4. Okay. All right. So, so, all right. All right, well, well, that bishop on b6 is basically, we can eliminate that tempo and prevent that. So we can play bishop e3. Bishop e3. Mm -hmm. But with bishop e3, okay, this is a kind of move which gives black time to even play knight c6 and rook d8. Okay. You said at the beginning that the strongest pieces are the knight on e6 before you changed like your mind and said like the, the let's say the most meaningful piece is the queen on e7. We know that e6 and e7 is a problem. So if we already understand it from the beginning, what is the automatism? We should try to exchange them both and okay. suddenly black. So I'm going to take the bishop on e6 and then play queen h4. Yes, and this is actually just game over because after queen takes c6, yeah. we lose immediately on d6. And here, the position totally collapses because we have always queen d8 check 
to exchange the queen in case of queen d7 or queen f8 and then bishop c7 we win that pawn we will win that pawn and we will have just a winning position that's why especially in a middle game when you don't have a plan to always think what is beneficial mm -hmm. to exchange and what is the strongest part in your opponent's position can help you to find the right track in order to play the best moves and here that maneuver of bishop e6 and queen h4 is just basically um finishing the game from a technical point of view okay hey sabrina hoja thank you for the cheer greatly appreciate it thank you okay um all right that so here in the game queen d7 was played queen da check but let's um shortly just because of the pawn structure you mentioned this is also a problem about the automatism that third moves you exclude because for example like you excluded at the beginning bishop takes e6 i don't remember for what you excluded it but there was some kind of automatism the same for the pawn structure if you remember yeah yeah, yeah and this yeah. kind of automatism is one of the biggest problems for less experienced players because um, mm -hmm. It may misguide you and you may miss big opportunities because of this sure. kind of mindset, which is too quickly bringing a judgment in a certain position. Agreed. No, I mean, the focus on let's keep the bishop pair on board is, uh, you know, is there. So it's a concrete evaluation always trumps the general ideas. Okay. So here, after she takes h4, for example, if uh, let's say knight d7 or knight c6, let's say knight d7, I can take on d6 and okay, this position, even like having this pawn or not, I can even try later on to play h5 to fix the pawn structure. But you see that e6 is falling, b7 is weak. And even this double pawn is not actually that weak because we could hold these two pawns alone with my pawn on h4 understood okay so in, in the game queen d7 was played queen d8 check he took took knight d7 bishop c7 i will just show you two more moves he played knight c5 he took and after rook c8 bishop b6 knight a4 rook takes c6 he later on won that game because okay he has bishop d4 and rook e7 coming and he would just end up in a technically winning position okay okay now the next thing it's similar but a bit different okay okay so now you should see the position from white's point of okay view. all right Okay, so material is equal. Mm -hmm. um, we have opposite side castles, which yep. means it's a little bit of a horse race. Mm -hmm. uh, we also have I mean, we have exactly one check, which is also a capture, but that's not meaningful. You mean bishop takes h7 for yes. now, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Which uh, doesn't do much, unfortunately. You know, knight, bishop h7 takes with a knight, play h6, g6, and we haven't achieved much. Or maybe not. Or Okay, let me put it aside. Um threats we can attack the queen we have we don't have any real pawn challenge here um i'm not seeing you know we have to parry an obvious threat of c4 which would mm -hmm. pin the bishop um which basically means uh that a queen move is an obvious candidate to get out of that pin Okay, let's, um, before um, you digest the candidate move, what yeah. kind of defense by rule is usually the best defense? It's a counterattack. 
it's a counter attack because I mean like to make a kind of move where you don't lose time because if I move the queen you have to agree we don't likely create a counter attack and we lose time black has time to play bishop b7 or b4 c4 I mean black has time but if you make a move which is also killing the threat but on the same way creating a kind of counter attack then of course it would be the most preferable one in order to um, continue the game. So we should find a move obviously to prevent c4, but also not to give our opponent necessary time to improve his position. Okay, understood, uh, fair enough. And hello to my dear friend Bullet Mercenary. Let's just give him a quick shout out and uh, yeah. And please give Bullet Mercenary a follow. Uh, he has recently started streaming and I'm looking forward to seeing more of his streams. Okay. And thank you, Fearless Mustang, for the follow. That's very greatly appreciated. Thank you so much. All right. So going back to this position. Um, all right. So we need to find a counter threat. I mean, it's, actually, I can tell you it's not like a direct counter threat, but it would definitely improve White's position. Yeah. And once again, it's always a very good question to ask yourself what are the strongest pieces in Black's position. This question in any moment actually may be helpful in getting the right guidance to how to continue the game. Okay. All right, so there, there are a couple of, I mean, you have this rook on d8. Mm -hmm. Then uh, you have this uh, bishop on e7, with, without which black would be almost immediately subject to a tactical, tactical threat. And so... And then you have the queen on b6, which is kind of act active, but she, she's, I mean, it's potential there. All right, so um, motive here is if we were to get rid of this bishop, then we can play bishop on h7. So in other words, instead of, so, I think bishop h4 is a good candidate move mm -hmm. with an idea that if we, if black takes, we take and then black can play c4, but then we will play bishop h7 and collect the rook. Exactly. And if you look at the beginning, before we even look about c4 and your immediate reaction was the queen likely has to move somewhere. This is like always a risk of the automatism that this is immediately something very human which crosses your mind. You see yeah. the opposition and you see you have to move the queen. But before even getting into this, if you just compare all your pieces, you quickly understand this bishop is objectively the weakest one because it's hitting against his own pawn. And this bishop is a very strong one because, okay, thanks to that pawn on e5, the square is d6 and f6 could be much more vulnerable. So immediately you already understand, okay, the bishop on e7 is a general problem, also avoiding the tactical trick of bishop takes h7. And if you just look at the position from the start and compare the pieces, the move bishop h4 is not far anymore to understand that this kind of defense is the most active one, because yeah. after the exchange, you don't only win the control over the black squares, you also create the counter attack on h7. Yeah. Very good. So bishop b7 was played here and now after rook h4, uh, rook g4, queen g5, queen h6 ideas would arise. And I don't want to continue now this game here because okay, black was just much worse after the next few moves as there were ideas like rook h1, queen f6 and h6 coming. And later on, white won the game, which is for us not important. I just wanted to give you a small introduction mm -hmm. on how important it is to exchange the right pieces and to always think in this way, because it may really be helpful in certain moments in your game. Okay. okay. Now we go into something totally different. 
we go into end game section. Okay. I mean, as I said today, it's a mix up of a lot of different things just to see the general impression. No, oh, thank you. That's good. So, now we get into the practical end game section, playing with the bishop pair as one thing. The bishop pair in the end game and the bishop pair in the middle game, they have similar rules, but there is also some kind of different rule which I briefly will introduce. In the middle game, often you sacrifice sometimes pawns in order to open up the diagonals. In end games, sacrifices are less common. In end games, often you try to even play against the mobility of your opponent's knight. Here in this example, we will not face it, but this is a kind of general rule which is useful to know. Despite that, playing with the bishop pair in the end game, king activation, space advantage, and later on exchanging one of the bishops in order to get a winning position is common. Let's have a look at this position, Nicola, and tell me what would be here in general the right idea to improve. Okay. Um... Okay, so well, you have we have this open H file, which is interesting, mm -hmm. and we can probably double the rooks before Black can parry because of that somewhat unfortunately placed bishop on G seven. Um, we have a bishop pair, so we probably want to um, open up the position. Yes. What are the possibilities here in order to open the position? Okay. That's actually an interesting question. Also, we so we have. You know, we, we can, I'm not saying we're going to play it because that's obviously immediately losing if we play f4 here. So that's the pawn. Um, in other words, that's, that's a pawn push. We can also do a pawn push on b4. Yes, so we have these two pawn pushes in order to open up the position. position yeah. Which of these two pawn pushes is, um, let's say, less efficient or probably the more um, attractive one in general. Well, if we if we do f4 pawn, even if we, if we even when we prepare it, we're going to open up this bishop on g7 that's right now doing much. So we'll be activating one of the black's worst pieces, which is this bishop on g7. Yes, besides that, you would give up a very important central square. Yes which is the square on e5. So we can already, from this point of view, exclude f4 unless we would win huge material, which is no. not the case. No. Not to mention that if we play f4, we, this knight is there and it would take uh, two or three moves to prepare it. So that doesn't work. So we, that leaves b4. Mm -hmm. And the, you know, we kind of cannot, I don't think it can be played immediately. Yes. So we need to prepare it. Mm -hmm. And we do not want to allow black to play a5 and to block that uh, avenue. Mm -hmm. So, and, you know, if we push b4, pawn on c4 will become, a, and a4 will become weaknesses. And the black knight can come here. So we probably want to play a5 first. So that's a candidate move. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not sure that playing along the h file is going to get us anything because we don't. Let me put it this way even if we park the rook on h7, it's not. It, there is no real follow up without the queen. So. So your move here in this position would be a5. Yes. Very, very good. I mean, I'm really like speechless because I gave this position also to my students, which are like 
stronger than you and they suggested group b1 and after a5 i told them that the train left the station forever okay so it was very important here to play a5 because if you don't do it as you rightly figured out for example that would be a crucial mistake after a5 you get the square which you cannot use because okay i protect on d6 and you won't be able to break through the position at all and the position likely is just a draw yeah so a5 was played by Karpov against Spassky and with a5, of course, I have all the time in the world to push b4. So now f6 was um, answered by Spassky. What would be here your next move? Okay. All right, so... All right, so obviously... <clears throat> All right, so we can take on f6, which is, um, and uh, now we, there is some possibility of a push on the, on this, uh, on the f file for black, which is much more convenient. But basically, we want in this position, this position to kind of keep the knights locked down because you know this this i mean this knight has nowhere to go and even if it goes on f6 at some point the pawn on f3 is kind of dominating it and knight h5 f4 may or may not be too slow so okay All right, so here is here are a couple of thoughts. Uh, we can take and then knight takes, presumably. Mm -hmm. And then after knight takes, then we can play rook b1. Yes, probably knight h5. And then we can play rook h1 to kind of block that knight. Okay, I have king g8. Okay. I mean, the question actually, Nicola, is mm -hmm. currently, is f6 for us anyhow disturbing? I mean, if we ignore it, for example, does it disturb us? Is there any idea like black can have if we ignore it? Not really. And we actually give gifting a tempo if uh, we... Yes, play. if we take on f6, we just give some activity, yeah. which currently is for us not necessary to give because okay the knight on d7 maybe is also defender but objectively the knight on d7 is not doing anything yeah so we can play rook b1 immediately yes that's what Karbov did because okay if black wants to push f5 he could have done it immediately and even if he pushes f5 it doesn't disturb us because yeah. everything is under control so he went for rook eb1 rook ab1 or eb1 i think there's not much of a difference to be honest F takes g5 was played now by black. What would be here your next move? Hmm, okay. Good question. All right, so one way that black has to activate one of its pieces is this maneuver here to play f6, h5, f4, right? This takes a long time, That's but... three moves. Mm -hmm. uh, another option is to play, to double the rook on f file, but that hits this. Even though the bishop on e2 is e2 is doing a perfect job, even yes, if you double the yeah. rooks on f7. I mean, the main question you should ask yourself: Do you have to capture back on g5, or you follow your plan with b4? I mean, that is yeah. basically the two main questions uh, in this yeah, position. Yeah. No, uh, couldn't agree more. Uh, I don't think. I mean, if he plays g4. I'm not sure it's 
you know, make, uh, I don't think I need, even need to capture on, on G5, do I? I mean, you mean like you don't need to capture now on G5 or you mean like after G4 you don't need to capture or? Uh, well, after G4, I do need to cap. I mean, I do need it, to capture. Of course, you capture, but I mean, G4 is not helping Fleck in any case. You capture no. until like uh, even H5 square is protected. No, so nothing and, to this, yeah, and some moves like King King H7 and Bishop H6 fall fall to this pen. So I okay. think uh, the right. Oh, come on, I want to remove the arrows. Won't let me. Okay, I would just play B4 here. Yeah, very good. That's what Karpov did because he didn't see any necess necess necessity to take on g5 because, okay, this pawn is not running away. If you play bishop f6, it's not like you're defending a very great pawn. Yeah. So he played b4 and now actually it was the last critical moment in the game. Spassky played knight f5. How would you react? And this is one of the biggest issues, I believe, in chess, the right practical decision. Yeah, that sounds like a Spassky move. He didn't want to defend this position. Huh. Okay. The, if I'm Karpov, here is here here are thoughts. If I capture this, then I am takes. Then I have some nasty threats with e4, and this bishop becomes a monster. Uh huh. So if you capture on f5, you get material, but you face a kind of strong counterattack, which for engine means is probably nothing, but which for human means might be, especially for your heart rate, a bit stressful. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> I mean, not for yours, but in general, no, like, no, it will all be the same for, for my too. heart rate. For mine too. God knows. <laughs> okay. Uh, so, uh, you know, I can almost the the alternative is to ignore it play something i'm sorry play something like bishop f2 but why bishop f2 now why not today now actually even now i can three. actually take the pawn yes that's what cup of did yeah and and the issue here is is this outpost for the knight on d4 really that much of a difference in the position and the answer is probably not no, because the knight on c3 is doing a perfect job. So, and the bishop on e2 is also protecting f3. Just yeah. to show it briefly, like if you take here, I mean, like, which is by engine, by the way, it's the strongest move, but Karpov is someone who never liked the issue of counter attacks, even though he knows that from the uh, material point of view, the compensation is not enough. But here, there's, for example, e4, you have to play bishop d2 because of the hanging knight. And now after take, take, and she takes f, okay, these pawns suddenly, they become moving. You have knight e5 to come. And okay, you have to be suddenly careful. And Karpov understood with bishop takes g5, he keeps his huge positional advantage. Mm -hmm. He doesn't have any headaches. And yeah. he still has one plan to hit on one of these weaknesses and eventually win one of them. And that's why he captured on g5. Now knight d4 was played and here it was the last critical moment or the last decisive moment for white to play a move and get a winning position. So what did Karpov play here in order to, well, get, let's say, a technically win position? Okay, one candidate move is b5. Yes, but I mean, like, as usual, like, what we should always calculate first. We should calculate checks, and do we have a check on h1? And we, besides checks, what we, is we the have second captures. Point? Yes, the capture. And capture. we actually have exactly one capture on c5, mm -hmm. which is, doesn't look appealing because we have created an outpost for the Black Knight. That is true, but what are the two weaknesses in Plex Camp? We have b7 and d6. Absolutely right. So that's why it makes sense to calculate captures on c5, because otherwise we are not able to hit the weakness on d6. All right, so... Hmm. All right, so we're going to take on c5. 
All right, so, okay. So we're gonna take on C5, Knight C5. Um, we're gonna play Rook B6. Mm -hmm. And there is no way for black to defend on D6. Yes, and once again, it was a kind of like, you know, proof that you automatism because you say b takes c4 the knight takes c4 yep. becomes a very strong outpost the automatism once again would likely or perhaps would stop you even to consider it okay and that's why i and like i was working with less experienced players and i always like yep. eventually had the same conclusion this really hard burned automatism Mm -hmm. often avoids you to find opportunities and this is very human and very natural and also happens to us but we sometimes force ourselves still to consider it because we know that we can be um well uh, we can be betrayed by our own intuition yes and god knows that happens to me quite frequently and there is no way and once the d6 spawn the rest of the black's position collapses Yes, and that's, I mean, that's why, I mean, like, I believe the biggest, like, difference between experienced players and less experienced players mm -hmm. or stronger players and weaker players is especially the way you are excluding thoughts right out of, like, your intuition, not even considering them until the very end. Okay. So B takes C5, Knight takes C5, and after Rook B6, basically the position from Spassky collapses. He went for bishop f6 and here once again typical for karpov he found a last needle stitch what could be here the needle stitch what move could be even more interesting let's say than bishop h6 which is the way here to win the pawn but here is a very much even stronger move over bishop h6 okay we have a check on h1 mm -hmm which actually is pretty strong move yes and you found the needle stitch on yeah. the uh, because right then on we the can play bishop h6 and it's game over and what is the difference after rook h1 king g8 what additional option actually white got which he doesn't have in this position um in after rook g rook h1 king g8, g8. Yes. bishop h6 okay uh, instead of bishop h6 what other moves to calculate here because okay. we can play bishop h6 immediately and there's not a big difference between the check no, or not i got you no, no, understood uh well bishop g8 then hold on what else do we have hmm all right i'm not seeing it so let me bear with me for a second uh, hey, Lali, my friend, it's very good to see you. Uh, after, okay, so after rook h1, king g8, we can take on d6. Yes, this is the additional otherwise. option, which is much more killing for um, black yeah. than to play immediately bishop h6. Yeah. That's why the check happened. And I mean, just the reaction from Spassky was he went even for King G7 voluntary. And here we win the tempo with an additional check. And that's basically how the game eventually ended. Okay. Very good. Thank you. Hey, Aaron Go, my friend. It's very good to see you. And very sound hombre. Thank you. Um, yeah. Okay, now I will like, okay, I mean, we can do one more technical thing. But um, I would prefer, because I understand now a little bit more, what I would prefer as the last position, or one of the last, is to test your calculation process. This is I'm, okay. Thank something you. I'm very curious about. OK. So here. Oh, thank you, Store2709. Thank you for the sub. Very greatly appreciated, my friend. Koala. So it's white to move and it is not a composition. It's really happened in the game between Jose Fernando and Mastro Vasilis Dimitrios. I don't know about Fernando, but Dimitrios Mastro Vasilis is actually a GM, but it's white to move. 
Okay. All right, so, okay. So let's do the usual analysis here. Uh, material is, white is a pawn down. Um, white doesn't have any meaningful checks, I don't think. I mean, it's queen g6 and rook h8 don't exactly lead anywhere. Exactly. Um, okay. Threat, the primary threat is against, uh, against the king is we can play queen f6 with threatens mate on h8. Mm -hmm. So that's like an immediate candidate move. Okay. So since this is probably the only candidate move as you have also queen h4 and these are moves with a threat, let's just calculate it. Right. Yeah, no, queen f6 is there, it's just finding the right sequence. The only way to defend the mate is queen g7. Exactly. And then after queen g7, we really do not have any other candidate move that's meaningful. That, Wait, we uh, have no captures and checks which are meaningful, but we have at least one threat yeah. which is interesting. Yeah, which is queen d8. Absolutely correct, yes. So, all right, so queen d8, queen does, okay, R there is no way to defend that bishop. Actually, is there a way to defend this bishop? Is it possible to, if Black can play king f8, but that's, hmm. Now queen d6 and they will collect all the pawns, so that's not meaningful. So black needs to get back to king f8. And now what to the queen motive f8. is? To, queen yeah, okay, f8. I see the sequence, I think, Ali. All right, so queen f6. Queen g7, queen d8, queen f8, bishop c6. If bishop Rook takes on c6, we review a check on h8, we capture the queen, and that's a mate. Yes, but after bishop c6, what is still a defense? Hmm. Okay. Because I will not voluntarily capture and get into the problem with rook h8, right? Yes, so we have... It's going to play rook e7. Uh-huh. Yes, rook e7. Okay. All right. So, very good. What do we have thereafter? Hmm. All right. What am I I'm missing something? What am I missing? that this must be the sequence. Let's see here. So after rook e7, if we don't have a good continuation, we have to improve our, let's say, variation somehow. Yeah, I mean, it's almost a zugzwang, but unfortunately, black can push the deep on. Yes, and uh, despite uh, if I move my rook, then c6 is hanging, because we yes. need the rook to hit on h8. But now we, we already have the pattern. The pattern is connected to the trick of rook h8 check and queen takes f8, right? Correct. Yeah. So now we have the pattern. Now we just have to make the whole pattern work. All right, so how can we make that work? Let me think for a second. Well, okay, can we swing then the rook? Do we have time to swing the rook to a3 and bring it to a8? 
but the moment we are swinging it, I think I can capture on c6 the and, bishop, right? Yeah, yeah, and then we don't have the threat, so we don't have time for that. All right. Hmm. I mean, like if you consider the whole variation which was in your mind, mm -hmm. what was the biggest problem from the whole variation? Which black piece was actually making the whole thing not work out the way we wanted? In the end, it was rook e7. Yeah, okay, the rook, but on, however, the rook on a7, we cannot do anything to distract mm -hmm. that rook on the seventh rank. But it was not only the rook which was a disturbing piece here, right? Yeah, it was the, I mean, queen is the one who is doing the yeoman's work defending. Yes, but not only the queen, because if and you, for bishop. example, like, yeah. if you take one piece out from this position right now, all we need to take out is a bishop and the whole thing would work. Right? If, yeah, I know. If you remove the bishop on e8. Yes, if you just take it in our hand and take it away, the whole thing suddenly works. Correct. And that's how basically, so like. Put... To... Yeah, 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 I got it. Yeah. So we basically, instead of playing bishop c6 at the end of the sequence, we need to play it at the beginning of the sequence. Absolutely right. You just, that's what I mean. Yeah. Like when you calculate yeah. and you recognize a pattern. What you have to do is to all these puzzles yeah. of information to put in the right order. And then yes. actually, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I see it. So it's bishop c6 and then king f6 is immediately winning. And the, the thing is like that now I can not change the order with rook e7 to be prophylactical because the problem yeah. is here that the rook is hanging. Yes. Nice. And sometimes this is the kind of mindset you should, when you see a recognize a pattern, you should understand what is the disturbing mm -hmm. factor of the patterns, what of this disturbance I can distract or remove. Here yeah. it was the only one which we can distract from the pattern who was the bishop on e8 eventually. Yes, no, no, I got it. Okay, let's have one more, which okay. is a similar kind of thing different but similar from the um, mindset way. One second, here we go. And you are black. Okay, let me flip the board. Okay. All right. Okay, so no checks apart from check and capture on G2. Uh-huh, yes. Uh, they are kept, I mean, that's actually the only meaningful capture that I can see capturing on D4 is not meaningful. Uh -huh. um, so that's like an immediate candidate move. Yes, what are the other candidates in this position may offer? Uh, okay, so there is a candidate move. To, we have. All right, so here is to follow what you what you suggested, which I think it's very good. Uh, fearless Mustang C five Knight G three, and that's basically blocked. Mm -hmm. um, so trick here is. Um, you know, how we can, you know, is immediate queen g5, uh, rook g2 actually better, which is something to consider. I mean, look, to, to sum it up for now, we had rook takes g2, we have the motive of queen d5, we have the motive of c5. Yes. Right. Yeah, exactly. These are like all kind of candidates which maybe in some moments may take place. However, you understood correctly, if you start with queen d5 or c5, there's always knight g3. Yes. But one more thing here, if you look at this position, you actually forgot. And if you look at white's position, which is very important for any tactics for you and also for your opponent, mm -hmm. this is unprotected pieces. Yeah, agreed. Um... 
we have a queen on a4 that's unprotected and we have a knight on h5 that's unprotected yes and what these two pieces do have in common which i mean like on which square black can indirectly hit on both these pieces indirectly well one i mean if there I were mean, no pawns queen uh, we can do e8 is one of them yes yeah, the only one because queen yeah. e8 is the only square where we indirectly like have us like a shining glance on h5 and on a4 so now we have all the puzzles together we have all the motives together yeah, all the now pieces the... now we need to assemble the puzzle okay yes you have to pr bring the puzzle in the right order okay all right so okay so we can hey van van corrales thank you for the follow very greatly appreciated thank you all right so the candidate moves then become a little interesting because okay huh all right so the thing is we can play queen e8 now and then that's a threat but the problem is that white plays knight g3 and we don't have much or if anything yes. so that's not the right order mm -hmm. um we can we can play queen d5 but that's not the right order for the very simple reason that knight g3 blocks all the threats we had that would work if the pawn was on c5 so if we play knight rook g2 immediately and then queen d5 f3 is we're not we're not getting we're not getting a mate hmm. okay So, so Phil Mustang, you were saying take on g2, takes with a king, and then play queen e8, and it's winning. But what do we do after knight g3? That's a question you can maybe answer yourself. And then we give a check on c5, and we grab the queen. Okay, so that's the motive. Good job. Good job, Phil Mustang. Yeah. So, yeah. So that's the sequence okay nice you have a very strong chat <laughs> yeah. yeah nice uh okay. Paligras is i think a gm right Paligras is it a fearless uh mustang is Paligras? i uh, know Paligras is uh yes he's a gm from romania yeah he okay. was black here okay all right so not to self watch the watch for unprotected pieces yes okay. i mean like this, sure. is, this is not only a rule for your opponent this is also a rule for yourself if you mm -hmm. have in the game unprotected pieces then there's often automatic tactical things arising and that's why this should always like i would say to my kids to make your alarm bells ring yeah. neither for you or also for your opponent because okay. unprotected pieces in general um allow a lot of tactics okay. uh Dirk is asking us to execute on the board yes so. i will do it one you, second you want to do it yeah go ahead oh yes so basically like we had all the puzzles of queen e8 hitting on these two squares we had the diagonal we had this as a main actor and we had this as a main actor and we had the pawn on the main actor and in order to make it work we had to find the right um sequence 
which was not difficult in a way that you know that Knight G3 is most one of the best defenders in this position. That's why we had to bring the king into some indirect um, opposition with the bishop on the diagonal. And now with queen e8, we had a double attack. We had the attack of c5 check and we had the double attack with capturing the knight. In the game, by the way, queen b3 was played. Queen takes h5 happened on the board. And after queen takes e6, what do you think, Nicola, is stronger? Queen f7 or king f8? Well, we are threatening if we, I'm sorry. <coughs> My apologies. Um, if we put king on f8, we're threatening c5. Mm -hmm. But c5, d5. Um, thank you, Dirkia. Um, then, uh, yeah. All right. Yeah, I've, I think uh, playing, uh, there is nothing with that open, the discovered check. I will play king f7. Queen f7, sorry. Queen f7. Okay. Now the other question is like, what do you think? Which king is weaker? The black's king or the white's king? In this position? Yep. Good question, actually. Hmm. I mean, white king is, he has more pieces arrayed, arrayed against it. Uh, black king has only the queen against it, and those rooks are going to take some time to develop. And I don't see how uh, any of the white rooks can get to the white to the black king. So I would mm -hmm. say white king. And the rule says. If your opponent's king is weaker or weak, then we don't exchange the queens. So here between queen f7 and king mm -hmm. f8, there's a huge difference in terms of advantage. Probably even the weak chess.com engine can show it. He clearly <laughs> favors king f8 over queen f7 for the reason that after king f8, white's king remain weak. And it's not only because of c5. We have also the idea of rook d8, rook d6, and rook g6. Okay. And the advantage is much bigger if you keep the queens on the board. And you can re remember as a general rule, if your opponent's king is weak, then you don't exchange the queens. This is, of okay. course, the exceptions, because sure. with queen of seven, you have a better position, but your material advantage is not that huge. But okay. with king f8, you keep the king just weak and you have still a huge attack. Okay, yeah, agreed. So, you want the last one, which actually I like very much, from Anna Mutsushuk's games. Oh, okay. Let's give a shout out to Anna while we are at it. Even though I, I know like she was 14 years old in this game, so she was uh -huh. a small beauty. <laughs> But it was a very nice exercise, in my opinion. Okay. One second, I'll just build it up. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, it's Anit. It's good to see you. Okay. And Anit, please, you be quiet about it, because I think Anit saw that. I think you didn't see that one, right? Because probably you didn't see that one. As I think I showed it in my first camp and not in my second one, but I'm not sure. Okay. All right. So. All right. So material is the same. White has an advantage in space and development. Um, if I recall correctly, undefended piece is technically also if it has the same number of attackers and defenders so bishop on b5 is very good let's mm -hmm. um okay the queen is all right so basically this bishop on b5 is defended by the queen 
that queen is in a little bit of a trouble. Okay, so, and the queen needs to stay on the fifth rank. And she has, she has exactly one place on it. So if we play, so, so it's temptation here is to play g4, which that would be a candidate move, yes. So that might be a little bit dangerous because of knight g4. But I'm not sure that the queen itself can actually do anything. And there is a queen h3 and then knight g4, but we have this, this is a check. And then uh, we can, um, okay. So that's why I mean, at the, at the beginning, let's collect candidate moves. You have g4 as a candidate move. What other move could be maybe from the motive or the intuition be a candidate move even so in this position it will not bring us much because it's obviously about the bishop on b5 yes so in order to basically um somehow neutralize the queen on h5 we have the g4 motive but what other motive do we have okay i mean we can Well, we can play queen e2, but that just exchanges the queens, the, the material. So we need to have, I mean... It's just a collection of motives, which might be interesting, maybe not now, but maybe those motives could be interesting later on. So, okay. So what other motive could avoid the guidance or the guardians of the oh, queen yeah. of no, no, five? No, I understood. Uh, but the key thing here is that we're capturing with a check. Mm -hmm. So, so we can, but the queen is defended. All right. Yes, so. but still like, I mean, that's what I mean. Like we are only collecting ideas or motives. Sure. No, it no, doesn't no. matter if they work or not. No, no, Underst understood. All right. So G4 is one, one option. Mm -hmm. Another option is to basically um, remove the... remove the knight so we are threatening to exchange the queens so what kind of move are you precisely speaking about mm -hmm. with removing the knight okay we can play knight e5 so knight e5 is a pattern right yes even though the knight on e5 currently is not doing much no. because the queen on h5 is protected yes Yet we know that this motive may play a role because okay, it would like avoid the guidance between the queen on h5 and the bishop on b5. Now yes. we have two puzzle pieces. We have g4 and we have knight e5. Yeah. Which may be crucial for this position. And once again, what you have to do is to bring these two puzzle pieces into a good sequence. Okay. All right, so, uh, ah, thank you, Pavlokic. That's very greatly appreciated. Thank you. All right, so if we play knight e5, that obviously doesn't work because it, 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 or, hold on. Because black can ultimately just capture, can black capture e5 here? Hold on. All right, so if the sequence is knight e5, uh, bla uh, black can exchange, cannot exchange on d1. But, but can, he can take on c4, right? It can take on c4. Mm -hmm. And then we don't really have, I mean, 
I mean, we can grab the queen on h5 and then grab on c4 and the pawn on d6 is weak, but we haven't really achieved the necessary tactics. So we are there, there needs to be the knight e5 is not the beginning of the sequence. Mm -hmm. um, we can play g4, but then if, uh, ah, gotcha. <laughs> yeah, all right, fair enough. So this is the sequence, I think. It's g4. All right, let me get the arrows off. Come mm -hmm. on. So it's g4 and I guess knight g4. Mm -hmm. Then a knight e5. Absolutely, yeah. And then we are... And then if black takes on h3... We take on b5 with check and then capture the knight. And yes. we're and winning. Here, yeah. of course, nice. the difference okay. is like that with that sequence, we basically have a lot of pieces under attack and always under attack with a tempo. That's why in calculation process, it is always very good to watch out for hanging pieces, for watch out for candidates, even so they don't play a role in a certain moment. Still, these kind of patterns and motives, they can somehow still um, yet come into the position in a different sequence because they fit into the tactical patterns of the position. That's why a lot of Good trainers always suggest to collect candidate moves because sooner or later these candidate moves will help you in order to bring the puzzles into well a piece eventually. Cool. This is this is cool. Okay. So all right. So what um the takeaway is build up your library of motives. But at the same yeah. time, they're just pieces of the puzzle. Make sure that how those pieces come together is the important part. Okay. Yes, and watch out for the unprotected pieces because, okay, yeah. in every position is different, sure. but the calculation process often you, I mean, they're different kind of calculation. These calculations today, which I showed you, these three positions, they have something in common. It's something about the candidate moves the sequence you calculate and you see it doesn't work and you basically change the sequence and you bring the puzzles together. But sometimes, of course, like um, calculations can be totally different. They can be forced calculations and uh, hidden moves and stuff like this. This was just a, one um, topic of calculation which had this common thing about collecting candidate moves, watch out for unprotected pieces and this kind of stuff usually helps to improve your calculation if you take um, notes towards that. Okay. And Canard de Futur, it's, uh, I hope I'm pronouncing this correctly, it's a game between uh, Anna Muzichuk and Miranda Mikadze. Yes, so. and this game is very old. It's, I mean, Anna was 14, which means this game is um, 16 years ago. Okay. It was played 16 years ago between Anna and uh, the Georgian girl Mikatsu probably in the world championship under sure. 14 is my guess no European championship okay so okay you're welcome Canada if you do and okay thank you Ellie welcome <laughs> this was greatly appreciated it was a uh, it was a great first session um yeah, Durki, I know. <laughs> yeah, that's fine. You know what the worst part about feeling old is when you are telling somebody who is younger than you and uh, it's a story about something and then you realize in the middle of the story that that story happened when before the person you're talking to was born. That's tough. Anyway, all right. Thank you, Ali, so much for the for the session. Uh, this, guys, is going to be a, a regular session for uh, to uh, every, it will be every Wednesday on my channel at 7 a.m. Eastern Time. I'm sorry, Worship and other guys, it's, uh, this is an EU-friendly stream. Uh, my next stream will be on also EU-friendly on Friday with uh, uh, 
international master Alex Lopez. And then at 3 p.m. on Friday, it will be a special edition of Adopt Nicola with one and only international master Daniel Ranch. He has adopted Danny and I have adopted Nicola. So uh, he, I told him he would have some fun trying to adopt this time. So we're going to see how that works. And of course, if you put exclamation mark arena of open field media arenas are every Saturday at 9.15 a.m. Eastern. Mm -hmm. Elizabeth, thank you so much. That was very Welcome. greatly appreciated. Uh, I am, let's see, whom should we raid? Who is still, uh, okay. Uh, why don't we raid hashtag chess? They are, they're streaming chess now and it's Rebecca Sorkic say hello to hashtag and i will see you guys on friday talk to you soon and wish me luck against danny bye 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 okay uh, just make sure that the raid went through yep it did i'm gonna end the stream